I wanted to warn you kind of in advance. Um, thank you, Annika, for starting that. And um, I'll go ahead and get started with our introductions. Um, so welcome to our webinar, Creating Greater Transparency About Instructional Materials Through Course Marking. Um, my name is Nancy O'Neill, and I'm the Acting Director of the Kerwin Center for Academic Innovation at the University System of Maryland. I'd like to uh, invite you to introduce yourselves in the chat. So if you could list your name, your role, and your institution, that would be really wonderful to help get a sense of kind of who's in the room. We have about 90 people signed up for this. Um, so we're doing it through the chat in, in, in the interest of kind of getting a lot of information quickly. But we'd love to hear from you in terms of who you are and um, where you hail from. And then I'm going to set a little context for our this conversation before I turn things over to our main presenters. Annika, if you could go to the next slide. So the webinar is being presented as part of the Maryland Open Course Textbook Initiative, or MOST. MOST began in 2014 and supports faculty and institutions in broadening and deepening the use of freely accessible, openly licensed course materials, often called OER, which stands for Open Educational Resources. We accomplish this through grants, statewide convenings, research, webinars, and the like. Um, MOST is statewide, and the Kerman Center leads MOST in partnership with Maryland Online, the Maryland Association of Community Colleges, and the Maryland Independent College and University Association. The freely available part of OER means that the use of OER can help reduce the cost of instructional materials for students. And the open licensing at the heart of OER allows users, faculty, staff, and students to adapt and adjust the materials to meet their interests and needs with essentially advanced permission given to them by authors. They don't have to worry about going and obtaining permission or getting copyright clearance or any of that. That's already put out there with the open licensing. For those of you who are brand new to OER, I have some additional slides at the end of the deck that kind of talk about that a little bit more. We're not going to cover them in the session today, but those will be available when we send the deck out to folks who registered after the um, after the session. We also have a link to the most we uh, website at the end of this, and that has lots of information about what is OER, where to find it, that kind of thing as well. To date, faculty connected to most have moved to OER in nearly 200 courses across 28 institutions, and those are just our grantees. We think that's only the tip of the iceberg in terms of OER use across the state. And so I just wanted to set a little bit of that context. Now to move to our topic for the day, um, I wanna start with a question for you. Where is your institution with respect to course marking? So in the chat, if you could list a letter, um, haven't really considered it, what is course marking? Uh, exploring course marking. We're implementing it, we've done it, we're now sustaining it, or I'm not sure. I'm not sure where my institution is with respect to course marking. If you could let us know, um, that again, it's gonna give us a little bit of a feel for sort of where we are as a group on this. Lots of exploring, that's exciting. I'm not sure or not considering it present. This, is, this might be a first step in sort of thinking about it. Got one moving into implementing, which is exciting. Um, if we see more implementers or sustainers, those are great folks to get in touch with and stay connected to because they might have some lessons learned to share those of us who are in the exploring phase, um, just as our presenters will here momentarily. So thank you for letting us kind of know where everybody is on this. Um, Annika, if you could go to the next slide. So what is course marking? Um, the first piece of this talks about course marking is assigning attributes to courses in an institution's student information system to provide important information about courses to students. So in a class schedule, you might see courses marked for modality, or if there's, say, a strong experiential component or a service learning component, or if the course is designated as part of a learning community, just to give a couple of examples. These kinds of designations have been around for a while. Um, the second piece of this 
talks about including information about the nature and cost of instructional materials. So more recently, institutions have also begun to do course marking related to instructional materials. The nature of materials might mean, are they OER? Are they fully digital? That might be another attribute you could imagine putting into a marking system. Uh, and the cost of materials. So that might be a low cost designation or a zero cost designation. And we're gonna get into some of the nuances of those through our stories here in a minute. Um, our presenters are gonna talk about why they embarked upon course marking, but I'm gonna say just a couple of things about it up front. Annika, if you could go to the next slide. So why do course marking? First, I think, is to help students make informed choices at the point of registering for classes. Students register for classes, in some cases, pretty early um, relative to when they're actually gonna experience the course. And if they're not finding out about the cost of their instructional materials, for example, until really close to when the course starts, it could really change things for them. It could have real consequences for them financially in terms of whether or not they could feel like they could stay in that course whether they have to forego purchasing the materials and then might get behind their classmates in engaging in, with that course. So these all have important consequences for students. Um, course marking can also provide us insights into the range and variation of course materials that are in use by faculty. And out of the most initiative, we truly respect and, 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 and support faculty autonomy and academic freedom when it comes to the folks closest to those courses figuring out what's appropriate to assign in those courses. But this is an opportunity to kind of get to see the range and variation of what, what's already in use. And I could imagine there are opportunities, like if faculty members are working with a lot of homegrown materials, is there an opportunity there to engage them around open licensing that might turn those homegrown materials into OERs? This is an example. And then course marking, I think, can be a springboard into an examining student course taking patterns, enrollment intensity, and progression. There is some research on this. Um, a lot of it, or some of it at least, has come out of the Z degree work that's in Virginia, taking a look at how you know, having these designations and then the courses with low cost or no cost instructional materials can literally affect students' progression through courses and the amount of, you know, sort of the number of courses that they take, their enrollment intensity. And these things can have a very positive effect on students and around those things. So those are just some of the reasons why, um, but without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to our presenters. Um, I'm excited to have three amazing colleagues, Annika, if you could switch to the next slide, with us today who will be sharing their experiences with course marking. Um, and we'd really like to have your comments and questions in the chat as they talk, if you have things that come up um, and you're wondering about something with respect to what they're sharing. Dr. Hernandez, followed by Dr. Scott and Dr. Westerman, will discuss their motivations for pursuing course marking of instructional materials, their processes and stakeholder engagement, challenges encountered along the way, and benefits that they're seeing for students and for their institutions. And there's going to be some emphasis on kind of the pros and cons of marking courses around OER versus marking courses around cost, low cost or zero cost, things like that. So we're going to kind of dig into that a little bit in the spirit of the most initiative. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn things over to Shinta. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, it's really wonderful to see so many of you here interested in course marking. I am Shinta Hernandez. I am the Dean of the Virtual Campus at Montgomery College. And for those of you who may not be familiar where exactly where we are, we are in Montgomery County, just right, right outside of DC. So. Um, I have the fortunate opportunity to spend the next um, some minutes with you talking about how it all worked out at Montgomery College. We've been doing this for more than five years. Uh, so I want to share with you, though, if, uh, Hanukkah, if you can go to the next slide, I want to share with you what Montgomery College is very briefly, because this shows you why we embarked on this endeavor and why it was so important to us to sustain this effort, course marking, and just the overall open education efforts. So we are a two-year multi-campus public community college. We're open access. We are considered the largest community college in the state of Maryland through our undergraduate enrollment. And the next couple of things are very important. We've been ranked as the number one most diverse community college in the continental United States. And we're located in Montgomery County. Many of you probably know that we are one of the most diverse US counties. All of that to say that it was important for us to embark on this OER efforts because of the great diversity 
that is a part of who we are, the fabric of our institution. So we needed to ensure that that we met students where they were as far as affordability and inclusivity were concerned. Um, we have 43,000 students both on campus and online from 155 countries. And we are an Achieving the Dream School, ATD. And so we were again, had the opportunity to be one of the 38 schools to be a part of this degree initiative from ATD. So on the next slide, I, sh I wanna share with you um, just some of the, the details that happened during our uh, grant uh, work. So among these 38 grantees, uh, 13 states, we conducted, or, or ATD uh, conducted this, this grant opportunity for two years from August 2016 to December 2018. And the charge was for each of these schools to choose a degree program that would eventually become fully Z. So again, college affordability would be met, inclusivity would be achieved. And what we decided to do was instead of picking one of the degrees that, you know, like business or communications and what have you, at the beginning, we decided to do with general studies. And the reason is because the majority of our courses in general studies are general education classes, which eventually by default will hit all of the other programs anyway. So that was our way of, of maximizing impact through this grant. Now, we had a cross-functional team of about 20 people, and these people consisted of folks from across the college, including um, administrators, uh, faculty members, department chairs, registrar's office, um, uh, librarians. And so we, we wanted to make sure we heard people's voices as, as we embarked on this. And throughout the grant opportunity, our major emphasis was on making sure that faculty got what they needed to um, know what to do in OER development or OER research, that they also knew how to advise students in accordingly, particularly when we started the course marking and putting it on the course schedule, that counselors and faculty knew what those course markings meant. So on the next slide, I want to share with you uh, the different groups of our constituent groups who were involved from at the beginning of our uh, open education efforts. So you see how highly collaborative these efforts were. And since then, we have been able to add more, more um, constituent groups, such as librarians, um, instructional designers, our registrar's office, scheduling offices. So we have been able to uh, collaborate and partner with uh, so many offices across the uh, across the college. And not to be honest, that I think is one of the reasons why we've been able to sustain is because we have so many people who are champions of this work and understand the importance of it. So on the next slide, I wanna share with you another way that helped us with sustainability and success in this in this space. We align the open education effort with so many of our institutional um, documents and plans. So in our strategic plan, for example, in our academic master plan, as another example, there is verbiage in there that sh suggests open education efforts are critical for student success. That open education efforts are also critical for faculty teaching transformation and that support will be there for faculty and students to embark on this, on this journey. As I mentioned, we are an ATD school, so a lot of the emphasis in being an ATD school is that we increase equitable outcomes. So in our ATD mission, we also talk about the importance of open education. Hence, um, the, the ability for us to continue on this uh, endeavor of course marking. So now I wanna bring you to the next slide and show you something else that happened as a result of being a part of this grant. And that is we were able to create an infrastructure that is called MC Open that allows uh, us as, a, as an institution to provide the necessary resources, particularly for faculty and staff, as well as students to increase our open education efforts in various ways. And in fact, actually, I'm going to put in the chat for you the uh, website to MC Open. So when you get a chance, please take a look at it and you can see the vast opportunities and resources that we've made available to our faculty and staff. Now, on to the next slide, please. 
I want to give you a, a snapshot of the Z degrees and certificates that we've been able to um, uh, accomplish and deliver since the ATD grant. So now we have um, technically five Z degrees because we do count criminal justice as two different degrees since they have two pathways. So communications, criminal justice, early childhood education technology, general studies, and then the data science certificate. Business AA is on its way to being a Z degree. So we have, um, we're just one course away from it. So we're really excited to then be able to put business on this list as well. All of this could not be um, possible without going back to the notion of course marking. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. I wanted to share with you what the course marking looks like on our course schedule. So when a student is ready to look up a course and ready to register, here's an example of what the notation looks like. So for example, a sociology 100 class often looks like this. There's a lot of other verbiage that is it, that, it, that can is typically found in there, but I just took that away and, and gave you the relevant notation. So our notation says, this is a Z course. All text materials are available at no cost for this section. Regular internet access is required for access to materials. And for more information, see, and that's the website that I just shared in the chat. Also, another way on the course schedule site that students are able to filter is through this attribute type, where it says Z courses, students can just click on that and look for only Z courses. And we, I think, have done a, a pretty good job in marketing this to students and marketing it also to faculty and staff that by now, five, six years into it, students are, um, many of our students are well aware of what Z means or what open education means. So, while I can't necessarily say that the next several slides I'm gonna share with you are direct causation of course marking, we can certainly suggest that there's some correlation with what um, some of the outcomes that we've been able to see as a result of the ATD grant. So, and so let me just share with you, I, the question just popped up and I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but let me just share with you some of the benefits that um, course markings have had on Montgomery College. And some of that Nancy had already shared with you at the very beginning of the webinar. So number one, our students get to see at the front end what, um, what are the courses that are allowed, going to allow them to save money and they can plan accordingly. And then uh, secondly, when, when we have these Z course or course markings and we have MC open, we're able to market that in many different ways, whether that's simple, a simple flyer or during Open Education Week, we actually go onto all of our campuses and hand out brochures and chocolate bars. And pre-pandemic, we used to hand out cake slices, but we make it a fun event so that students become more aware of, of these notations, the Z courses. But also, if they're already aware of it, that they can tell their friends about it and share that information um, to their peers. And then a benefit to us more uh, on the institutional level is to be able to collect the right data. And shortly, I'll be able to share with you some of that data. And we could not have made, that could not have been possible had it not been for course markings, for example. Now, in the course of this, uh, of the work, there were some opportunities for growth. And I wanted to share with you that some of those opportunities for growth included um, having conversations with constituent groups across the college. Uh, and I mentioned to you earlier that um, as we grew in our efforts, we included other, other, groups of people, instructional designers and librarians especially, in the conversation as well as the work. So that's been wonderful to see. Another opportunity, we use a Banner at Montgomery College. So making sure that the folks who are well-versed in Banner knew what to do inside that system to make sure that we had the course notation as well as the attribute type in, in the as a filtering option. And then the infrastructure, as I mentioned. Um, to launch the open pedagogy efforts. Uh, MC Open was our infrastructure and continues to be our infrastructure. And that's the platform that uh, provides um, resources to our faculty and staff. So on the next slide, I'll share with you some of the data that we've been able to collect as a result of course marking. So when we pull out just the Z labeling of all these courses, we are able to show you, for example, student enrollments. Now I wanna share with you the, the enrollment of course for fall is still being collected. So we're, we don't have that yet, but um, you, we, we hope to see a similar pattern across the board that it's remained sort of steady. 
Now, granted that I think a lot of us institutions are experiencing decline in enrollment. So that is essentially what you're likely seeing here too, is a decline in enrollment. Now on the next slide, what you do see, despite the decline in student enrollment, you see a growth in Z course sections. So more and more, it's becoming popular among our faculty, as you see with the growth, more and more faculty are realizing that open educational resources not only help our students afford college more, but it's also about inclusivity and equity that is the nature of open educational materials. And through our faculty professional development is how faculty are, are able to see how, how that uh, helps us achieve our equity and inclusion efforts. On the next slide, I'll share with you, uh, this is a lot of information, but essentially what this is telling us is that we see comparable success rates between the Z courses and the non-Z courses across these demographics. Now, of course, if we had the time, we could certainly go in and see, okay, which, which groups um, benefit more than others. But across the board, you see some comparable uh, student success rates. And I'm happy to share and talk about this off, offline if anybody is interested in, help, in delving in more into MC data. I can be there um, uh, to have that conversation with you. Now, on the next slide, here's where we're really excited. So course marking allows us to, to let the students know that these are the courses that will help them save money. But, and, and so, and that has been wonderful. We've been able to save students more than $10 million in Z courses across the six some years uh, that we've been doing this effort. And as I've showed you, the rates are pretty comparable. Student success rates are pretty comparable. Now we've taken open education and open pedagogy to a whole nother level, which is now creating fellowships that provide faculty resources to develop open educational materials and renewable assignment, assignments centered around social justice. So one of the ones, one of the fellowships that we've had running for almost six years is called the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Open Pedagogy Fellowship. Uh, and that's where that, that logo comes from. That's a fellowship that marries the UN goals with open pedagogy. And so from there, we've been able to provide the opportunities for faculty to say, open education can be more than just about costs. It is about social justice, it is about inclusivity, it is about equity, and, um, and making sure that we do meet students where they are, that students are agents of change, and that we should provide them the opportunities to become those change agents. So that wraps up. Uh, in a nutshell, that's pretty much what Montgomery College has done in these last uh, five or six years related to course marking, open education, and now open pedagogy. Thank you, Shanta. There are a couple of questions that might be immediately answered. I might, um, I'm wondering if we might want to save the instructor changes to after our colleagues from Towson go, because then maybe both could respond to that question. Um, but there was a question, are all of your introductory courses section Z or just specific ones? So, and then are you seeing an increase in enrollment in those courses when they became Z? Yeah. Thank you for those questions. Great questions. So um, many of the introductory sections are Z, but we also have some of our upper level courses that are Z as well, particularly the ones that are Z degrees. So Z degrees implies that even the upper level required courses have to be Z. So, so yes. And then we did see a change in enrollments. We saw some of the, the, the Z sections at the very beginning would fill up faster than the non-Z. Uh, and then over time, you're, you'll start to see that students are voting with their fingers, <laughs> technically, when they see a Z and they're filtering for Z, they're likely to, to jump on that one before any of the other ones, especially um, given the, the pandemic and the, the complexities of their lives. Do the fellowships provide a credit reassignment instead of teaching a class? Great question. So these fellowships at Montgomery Colleges, and so these are international partnerships, by the way, especially the United Nations one. We have over 12 partners across the world. Um, Montgomery Colleges side, we do offer um, some course release and partial course release. So they do get some uh, relief, if you will, uh, so that they have some time dedicated to the fellowship work. And a lot of these fellowships are actually over the summer because we recognize there's already a lot going on during the school year. 
Jessica, I see you raised your hand. Do you want to ask a quick question of Shinta? Yeah, I just was wondering about the, so I know the comparable um, success with, between Z and non-Z, but with the cost saving, I'm wondering if you looked at any type of persistence to degree with the, you know, between Z and non-Z. Yeah, so um, as a result of the ATD grant, we were also part of a study that they did, um, which took a smaller chunk of those 38 schools and became a part of the research study. And we did find that um, students who took Z were more likely to take two more credits or two more classes rather than those who were non-Z. So we did see some retention there. Great, thanks. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to go to Towson, and then we'll come back to this question about sort of the like sort of the, the how it works in the last minute when if a faculty switches sections or or courses. So we'll come back to that. But um, Jennifer and, and Trish, thank you, Nancy. This is Trish Westerman. I'm the assistant provost for the Faculty Academic Center of Excellence at Towson, or FACET, so it's our faculty. Development Center. We support faculty teaching, research, and mentoring. And Jen, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Jennifer Scott. I'm a professor in the Department of Physics, Astronomy, and Geosciences. I've been involved with OER efforts going back to um, an initial um, mini grant that I that I got with a colleague to uh, investigate materials for an astronomy course, and we've we've expanded that through all of our introductory astronomy sections serving uh, a few hundred students uh, each year. And uh, I also lead a, a community of practice that we'll talk a little bit about in our presentation. So I wanna give an overview of the approach that Towson University has been taking on OER. We um, applied for and received an institutional grant from most in uh, spring of 2020. We remember what was happening in spring of 2020. So that was a very interesting timing for us. So right as COVID was closing our campuses, we were receiving funding to grow OER. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about the objectives of that project as we go through um, our discussion today. We also had a provost course material task force that was established in response to a student government association resolution that was in the winter between 2020 and 2021. So that was um, the task force was established in uh, in the late spring of 2021. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the Maryland textbook affordability act, the free low cost course designations are the things that are the most relevant to this webinar. We'll, we'll spend quite a bit of time on our process in developing that approach. Um, the OER grants that we offer internally through FACET, which is my center that I um, lead, those are mini grants that we offer, and we'll talk a little bit about that. The community of practice that Jen just talked about that she leads, um, we'll talk about as well, and other activities um, that have helped us to grow OER on the campus. Next slide, and then Jen. So as Trish mentioned, mentioned um, Towson received an institutional grant from the MOST project in 2020. I was the PI of that grant, and uh, Trish was one of the co-eyes. We have a team of uh, faculty, uh, uh, staff from the libra library um, that uh, were, were leading that project. And um, and so FACET has really been crucial as a, as a coordinator for many, many of the efforts. Uh, we've partnered through the activities of this grant with uh, additional faculty through the mini grant program that, that Trish mentioned. So that has been in part funded by, by the USM grant and also by, by uh, FACET. Uh, we have brought students into our community practice, which was also a part of this institutional grant, but we'll talk about that a little bit separately in, in some slides later, um, uh, and um, engage with discussions with students about ways to uh, meet their needs. Uh, and, uh, and Trish will also discuss a little bit more going forward about how we have um, engaged with staff from the registrar's office um, and institutional research uh, to accomplish some of the goals, uh, in particular of course marking that um, have been established through the, the most project. So, so a lot of what we're talking about today is really under the umbrella of this grant. The primary objective of which was to um, 
expand the adoption of open educational resources across the campus. So some of us who were involved initially, you know, had been recipients of some of those individual uh, most mini grants over the previous years, but we really wanted to build out capacity across the campus and educate other faculty members about um, the, the importance of this and also um, a, a part of this grant was to uh, study and um, investigate the uh, pedagogical repercussions of using open educational resources in the courses. And so that's been an ongoing study where we observe courses as the instructors uh, uh, progressively uh, work through the, uh, the, the exploration and the uh, adoption of these materials in their courses. And so highlighted here, we see the, the course marking piece where um, we have worked with the registrar's office. We'll say a bit more about the details of, of that pro, uh, program that really just got started this, this, this fall semester uh, where students were able to see these designations in the, in the class schedule. Um, <clears throat> and so we a, a, a big part of the grant has really just been trying to um, not just expand the, the use of OER across campus, but also to assess the impact of that, not only in terms of numbers, but in terms of uh, uh, pedagogy, in particular, culturally responsive pedagogy. Next slide, please. And I'll let Trish take over for a few <laughs> slides from here. Thanks, Jen. So the provost textbook and course material task force, as I said, it came from the SGA resolution to decrease costs of course materials. And so the provost took that very seriously and formed this very short term group from April to about June of 2021 to look at the costs of course materials and try to find ways of decreasing those costs for the students. So these are the objectives, defining the problem, identifying benefits, proposing targets for reduction of cost, and proposing uh, recommended solutions. Next slide. So what we came up with over those couple of months, and th this uh, task force actually was uh, had representation from faculty, staff, administration, and students as well. It was about eight or 10 people. Um, recommendations that came forth include these that are in, uh, before you. Survey the faculty about current OER use, educate the faculty, communicate, the faculty responsibility under the textbook, textbook Affordability Act, um, target incentives for faculty, identify technology supports for OER development, improve the process for selection of required texts and other materials for courses, encourage inclusion of textbook and materials affordability in college strategic plans. Strategic plan was under review um, at that point, and we have a brand new strategic plan that rolled out about a year ago. So it was a really good alignment in terms of time with that. And revise the textbook adoption process to include a place for faculty to indicate that they are using cost-effective sources. And by that, we mean low cost, meaning under $50, or free, and that would be free to the students. So perhaps there's an institutional payment. Um, and these many of these uh, free and low cost sources are OER and many of them also are not. So we'll talk about that as well. Next slide, please, Jen. So as Trish mentioned, one of the outcomes or recommendations of the task force was to communicate uh, faculty responsibilities under the Maryland Textbook Affordability Act. Uh, uh, which was passed back in 2009. So speaking as a faculty member, I do remember learning about this at the time, but as with a lot of things that um, are on a particular faculty member's plate, sometimes, you know, one forgets uh, what, what we're mandated to do. I think there's a, you know, depending on your department, there may be a culture of, of um, these types of considerations for students. Uh, and so this is this very much in place, but it does bear, I think, repeating and reminding and educating faculty, communicating to faculty that, that this is really part, part of our responsibilities by law. And, uh, and so I think that um, in part that provides I think a few of the critical pieces that 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 come together on our campus uh, to uh, motivate some of the changes that we've been able to accomplish so far. So next slide, please. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, a part of our OER um, uh, institutional grant from uh, most 
has been to establish a community of practice. This includes uh, uh, about 45 to 50 faculty members and staff um, that engage with each other through meetings uh, about once a semester or so. Um, <clears throat> and we share um, particular resources, uh, strategies, challenges, uh, approaches that we have developed. We are part of the conversation on campus about um, establishing a, a platform for OER, uh, ways to do that revision and um, that sharing out, that's such a critical piece of, of the definition of open educational resources. Uh, the course marking has also been a part of the a community of practice that um, those initial discussions and um, as Trish mentioned, the, the particulars of how we we do the marking of the courses, at least so far, you know, in our in our um, current system that's that's just being piloted now. And uh, also we are engaged in efforts to disseminate our work and to let others know at um, on a regional national level what what folks have been up to. Next slide, please. And so um, as Trish mentioned, uh, uh, the new course designations that we have been doing uh, at Towson are in the course schedule, in the, in the schedule that students see as they are registering for classes many months in advance, as, as Nancy mentioned earlier. Uh, we really are just in the initial stages of this, uh, and so faculty um, were invited to indicate as they uh, indicated their, their textbooks. So we really tried to build this into uh, the process, the existing process, so as not to make something new for people to do, uh, other than to consider whether their course uh, materials qualified for the free or the low cost designations. And so uh, faculty members then as they submitted their textbook orders, which we would normally do before each semester anyway, uh, were able to designate whether their materials uh, met these qualifications. Uh, we, we had again in our community of practice, some discussions about these designations. I think, you know, there's still a certain amount of ambiguity um, surrounding them. Some, we, we did decide, for example, that courses that charge lab fees were, th that that lab fee was considered to be separate from this consideration of, of course materials. Uh, and so that's a, just a discussion we have to have go, you know, continue going forward. The lab fee would be indicated separately in the, um, in the course marking. And so students would be able to, to have that information. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, um, the, uh, the courses that were designated in the fall semester um, were over 360 courses were designated uh, in this way. And so we're going to be continuing with our analytics and, and uh, looking at enrollments and, and the hopefully growth of, of um, uh, sections, courses that are designated in this way going, going forward. So I'll let Trish take over with the next slide. Thanks. I took myself off video because my Wi-Fi was a bit unstable. So I may have to do that again. I apologize. So um, the the one of the next steps, as Jen said, was is that we will be differentiating between OER and other free uh, course materials, and that's something that the community of practice is taking the lead on. Um, also, about the community of practice, just to um, mention one thing, Jen is the lead of that community of practice, as we've said. Um, there is a meeting of the full community several times a year, but in addition, there's a leadership team that convenes separate from the community and does a great deal of work behind the scenes to continue building out this whole project. So I really uh, commend Jen on her great work in leadership in that area. We have identified a few barriers. I know people, um, we don't want to gloss over the fact that there are barriers sometimes that everything doesn't always go smoothly from start to finish on these types of projects. Something that has gone really smoothly is that we have had, we've been free of a lot of the barriers that um, might have happened. And that was because of the alignment of these, this first list of bullets here, the Affordability Act, the SGA resolution, the Provost Task Force, and then winning this institutional grant. This all um, really worked together. Um, to support the effort that we wanted to undertake on OER, including the course marking. So every uh, kind of all the arrows were pointing in the right direction, which was really nice. There were though some needs that we 
could identify as barriers here. And those are things like funding for faculty. Faculty work extremely hard. Our, our campus, at our campus, most faculty teach seven courses a year on average. So that's, and some teach more than that. And so um, just finding the time, you know, buying, buying out people's time or uh, paying, paying during the summer or stipends so that faculty can be incentivized and supported in doing work to identify OER and other free and low cost materials. That was really important to us. And we were able to do that through the institutional grant. We're really grateful to most for getting us started on that. And then that work will be sustained by the center. So we're really happy to, to have written that out into our strategic plan at FACET so that we'll be able to continue funding the internal mini grants and the workshops that we wanna provide. We obtain um, buy-in from faculty um, in a lot of different ways, and, and it really does represent a barrier in some ways and then an opportunity in other ways. Many faculty just don't want to do another trendy thing. I'll put quotes around the word trendy. They just think this is something that's going to be here and gone, just as many things in faculty development are and in kind of course redesign. Um, so obtaining buy-in is a really important thing to think about. How are you going to message your um, these opportunities in a way that faculty will recognize that they're really important for student success. All of the things that Shinta said, I really want to underscore. Our team has worked really hard to talk about not just the low cost, but all of the other great benefits of OER. And um, the solutions are the mini grants that we're offering now and that we've done um, for the last two years. And we want to have a summer intensive workshop slash boot camp, which will be a week long or two week long effort um, where we can identify people way ahead of time and have them do a little exploration before they come and then have them sit really shoulder to shoulder with people who are experienced in identifying and finding OER and help work through um, that work with them. So we're really excited about that boot camp. We haven't offered that before um, because during COVID our faculty were reticent about coming and spending a lot of time indoors in a physical environment with large groups. So um, we're, we're really hopeful that in the summer, we'll be able to start doing that again. Next slide, please. So course marking, um, this project, as Jen said, is nascent. We started it this fall. So last, um, building up to last spring, spring 2022, we worked really, really hard with um, a lot of different people on campus, the OTS, which is our tech office, primarily with the registrar's office as well, which was just exceedingly excited about working with us on this. So registrars too, as faculty are extremely busy, they have very heavy course uh, workloads rather. But as soon as we reached out and talked about this, the registrar and, and her um, direct, uh, so, uh, direct report came in immediately and were excited about kind of what do we need and how might they help and came with a, a whole bunch of different ideas about different approaches we might take. And then the community of practice worked really hard um, on what would be the best way to, you know, to do this, that we're really going to reach the students. And we're also at the same time going to keep encouraging faculty to take this on as a project. So really excited that we had enthusiastic partners on campus. We're talking about the further designation, as uh, Jen mentioned earlier, you know, how to designate in addition to low and low cost and free, you know, which ones are OER, open source, which ones offer students the um, opportunity to co-create materials with their faculty um, in the classes, which materials um, have other kinds of pedagogical utility that we can share in the marking, mark the marking itself so that the students start to learn just by looking in the course schedule. So they kind of accidentally pick up some great information um, as they seek their courses for the semester. Um, we plan to raise awareness in the faculty and students through um, these different ways. So we're facilitating a roundtable next month at an institution-wide summit on teaching that has a, a hundreds of faculty as well as student affairs, academic service staff um, will have a great deal of, um, of reach there. We continue to communicate with SGA um, all the time. So they're always in the loop on what we're doing. There's an SGA member that's in communication with me and with Jen all the time about what the community of practice is working on, what the community, what the OER leadership is working on. We um, will have a future story in the Tower Light student newspaper and in the TU Today, which is a daily email 
um, that is sent out to the entire campus. And we plan to implement a Blackboard banner. Blackboards are LMS during the most relevant times each semester. So that would probably be a week or so before the, the heavy registration period for um, each semester. So these are, are ways to increase the awareness in the students as well as the faculty. Next slide, please. Okay, Nancy, I think, this, you. I think this is you. Yeah, I think I think that's the end of your section, Trish and Jen. Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, Annika, do you want to say a couple words about this slide in particular? Hi, sure. Um, <clears throat> so if you're not familiar with this resource yet and this topic interests you, I would encourage you to take a look. Um, this is a um, open publication um, from which started at UT Arlington um, and is co-edited by a group of folks um, that we know well. And uh, it includes sort of an overview of all of the things that you need to know about marking open and affordable courses in terms of what are the like technology considerations, what are the policy considerations, who should be on your team. And then it also provides a series of case studies from different um, systems and institutions um, and different institution types on how they actually went about their process, very similar to what we just went through today from Montgomery College and Towson University. Um, so uh, first of all, definitely encourage folks to check out that resource. Secondly, um, there is an opportunity, this, this being an open um, publication, um, folks are continuing to add their perspectives and stories to this publication. It's continuing to grow. Um, so if, if you in your institutional settings are doing work like this and it's something that you want to share your story, um, you can reach out to us at most at usmd.edu. I'll put that in the chat and just let us know and we can get you in touch with the folks um, who are editing this, this growing and changing resource for the field. Um, so we welcome you to share your story as well. Thanks, Annika. And if you could go to the final slide, this is just our contact information for more information. Um, our presenters have graciously offered to, to follow up with folks who have more in-depth questions that they might want to pose to them. So their email addresses are here. That most email address is there that Annika mentioned and the, the link to our website. Um, so this will all go out to anyone who's registered along with the recording of today's session. But we have a little bit of time, so I want to kind of go back in order. Um, and the, the question came to us, uh, how are last minute instructor changes handled? For example, um, if, original, if an original instructor used a free textbook, but the replacement instructor does not. Any insights into that? I can share what we do at Montgomery College. Um, there are a couple of ways that we handle this. If it is a standalone course, meaning that that one instructor teaches that class a certain way, we'll let the instructor, the last minute instructor coming in know that it's a Z course. Um, and so that that person knows up front and we provide resources for that instructor. Now, a second way that we've handled things is we have a, a, something that's called common course. And these are generally standardized courses, online courses that have some standard elements including the book itself, including the open educational resources. So in those cases, it's easier to put in a faculty member if there is a last minute instructor switch because everybody already goes in knowing that this is a common course and the the, court, the, the material itself is standard across sections. At Towson University, we have not heard of this happening in our pilot year or pilot semester. I would presume that once it's um, once the course section is designated the way that it is, that that the faculty member that would be filling and would have to be in agreement to take on that um, that free or low cost material. Thank you. And there was a question about librarians specifically and the role um, that they're playing in your OER work. And I, Shinta, I see that you you responded and put a link in the chat. But I didn't know if you wanted to add anything else or if Trish and Jen, you wanted to add anything about the specific role of librarians. 
Well, I'll just add real quick, <laughs> just because I already put the, the URL in there. Please take a look at that faculty select program when you get a chance. Uh, it really shows you that um, the librarians play a critical role, as do instructional designers in all of our open education efforts. Um, honestly, without them, the faculty would I, would, I would bet you the faculty would say the same thing, that they've um, relied a lot on the librarians and the instructional designers. But take a look at that faculty select program website, please. And at Towson University, we have um, we have library faculty who work as liaisons to the college. There's one person who's the liaison to each of our colleges, and those <laughs> persons have been very involved in the OER work that we've been doing. Um, we also have an additional library faculty member who is an expert on copyright and open source materials, and so he's been very involved too. And there's been a recent hire that is um, going to be focused almost entirely on open source, so in the library. So we're very excited to get started working with that person as well. Thank you. And Rahana, do you wanna come off mute and, ask, and pose a question? Yes, hi. Thank you for this session. My question is about bookstores at your respective um, institutes. Do you have independent bookstores or are you using one of the larger vendors? Because I've Recently, there has been the inclusive access model across the country, which is not very supportive of um, C courses. So I was curious about your bookstores. I'll share a quick story about our um, uh -huh. experience with our bookstore. So we have Follett. And in the beginning of our ATD OER grant, um, there were a lot of conversations between the grant PIs and, and the bookstore trying to understand, okay, what, how is this gonna work? How can we coexist at Montgomery College? Um, what I will say now, six years later, um, the bookstore is still there, while it still exists. Uh, they just provide services slightly differently now. And so they've, they've gone through a reimagination process of, as, as well as the rest of us at the college. Um, but I think also they have seen what has become really important in our students' lives is that um, more and more of our faculty are understanding the, the need for our students to afford college by way of open educational resources or Z courses in this case, but also again, the need for us to achieve inclusivity and social justice by way of open educational resources. So I think at, at some point we've come to a happy medium, but it wasn't always that way at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and at, at Towson University, we I, I don't know, Jen, if you know if we have an affiliated or an independent bookstore, but our bookstore director and personnel have been really supportive of this project. Um, they just, it's been, I guess this is just how Towson University is. We are real team players. So when there's an interesting project that's going to help the students or help the faculty or both, everybody jumps in and wants to help out. So we've been um, really excited to work with the bookstore. All that they want is to just be aware of what's happening, what the faculty are choosing, so that they can help the students to make you know, the right choices for their courses. Um, I also had a question in the chat directed to me individually, Nancy, could I take that? Okay, so this is from Melissa Thomas. Thank you for your question, which was to identify how students search for OER, low cost, et cetera, at Towson University. The way that they search um, is that they can they can do a drop down and choose the word free, and then they get every single section in the universe at the university that offers um, free course materials. So that was 363 sections this fall. Uh, they can do the same with the term low cost, and that would again be designated as any course that whose course materials do cost do not exceed $50. So they can search that way. In addition, um, within the little summary that appears um, under, if they're just kind of browsing through all the sections of Psych 101 or English, whatever, um, they can. that also is shown um, within the summary. So two different ways to search, but they, they primarily have been using the drop-down menu so they can find all the sections. Just a couple of observations. Um, if we're waiting for additional questions in the chat. Um, so one is the, the terminology or nomenclature that you're using and how sort of apparent that would be to your end users, in this case, students. So are they readily gonna understand free or low cost? What do we mean by low cost? We communicate that. And then Cynthia, you talked about 
we did an awareness campaign to make sure that students understood what we meant by Z. So I think that's a thread that I was seeing across both of your stories is that idea of being really clear about what we mean by terminology that we're using. And of course, deliberate in our decision making about what, what we call this when we uh, are going through the process. That was really important. Another, uh, that's why we continue to work with ahead. the Student, Student Government Association at Towson University, just to be sure that that they help us to get that message out. Um, we also use digital signage. We used a lot of different ways to, just to give the definitions of the terms and to give a little bit of a blurb about um, this is coming soon and this is how you can implement it. And I'm also noticing that your course marking work in both cases is part of something larger. And so I, I frankly hadn't even thought about that in that way until you started sharing your stories here today. But of, of, it makes sense to me of when I'm hearing you say it. But if you could talk a little bit more about that or if there's anything you'd want to underscore about that, you didn't do this as kind of a separate or isolated activity. It was part of a larger set of strategies. Absolutely. For us at Montgomery College, we knew that course marking was simply one of many strategies that we would use to ensure that um, we achieve these goals for our students and that our students would eventually have increased access uh, and be a part of an inclusive environment and, and reduce their time and cost to completion. Um, and I had mentioned earlier about some of the fellowships that we ran or are running, and that is because as we continued on this endeavor of open education, course marking included, this allowed us to think of the next level up um, with different ways that would have a, an even more meaningful impact on our students' lives, uh, an experience in college that hopefully will be memorable to them. Uh, so it, it is part of a larger picture. You're absolutely right. And the same was true at Towson University. Access and affordability are really important to us at Towson. And so we wanted to be sure that we undertook the whole effort with an idea about cost savings for students. But we know also as faculty and as faculty leaders that there's so much more that can be done with OER and with open source materials. And so um, we've, we have found it easy to talk with faculty about course redesign um, as by coming in the door with the OER message. So if they have a heart for low cost or free, then you hit them with, you know, and this also gives you an opportunity to redesign your course. And let's talk about how you might do that, especially we have one case study um, in particular, I'll just be very quick here, Our, the art history course, which is two, um, two levels, it's 211 and 212. The faculty who lead those two courses decided to go after the OER mini grants together so that they could um, work on open source materials because they didn't think there was enough diversity in the the typical kind of Western art history textbooks that are used. And so they're redesigning their entire course um, in order to, and as a result of the, their interest in OER. So um, it's been really great to be able to situate it in, in the OER movement, this course marking that's happening. Um, we talk to the faculty all the time about the, if you're using OER, you wanna make sure everyone knows it, especially the students. Um, and then it will lead to positive peer pressure among the faculty. If, if the students are saying, I'm taking Dr. Smith's section because the courses, the course materials are free, then maybe a different faculty member will say, hey, maybe I should think about that so that I can help the students too. So it's been a really wonderful effort. Well, I might take an opportunity with the last couple of minutes in this session to say that um, if you found out about this webinar because you're on our most mailing list, great. And if you're not, but would like to be, you could email that most at usmd.edu email address and get on our mailing list. And I say that in part because that's where we'll advertise. It's one of the main ways we advertise our mini grant and institutional grant program. And we'll be coming up on our next cycle of that. Um, that's something that we launch every kind of early winter, spring. And we call we do a call for applications. Those come into us by March or so. Decisions are made around April. And then essentially at whatever level of grant, thank you, Annika, for putting that in the in the window, whatever level of grant you are, the idea is that, that next year would be your sort of implementation. And we do try to provide some structures and support for individuals and for institutions that are embarking upon this work with us through the most initiative. 
just want to put a quick plug in there if that if any of those those things sparked your interest from from our stories today um, there's an opportunity to jump in and get involved through the most initiative this coming um, academic year as well uh, thank you so much to our three presenters so appreciative of your time and also so appreciative of everyone's time and attention in, in joining us today we know this is a very busy time of year and really, really appreciate um, your presence with us today and wish you all a wonderful close out to the semester if you're on a semester um, cycle and a very, very happy new year. So take care. We'll send this out and the, the slides as well to everyone who registered. Take care.